and good afternoon. I am Tracy Sinclair and we're getting ready to go live to a press conference down in Juneau. Uh, Governor Mike Dunleavy is going to be talking about a public opinion poll that was taken on the uh, education in Alaska. So we don't have a lot of details yet. We can take a look at the um, room down in Juneau. We are, as I said, getting ready for this press conference. The governor is expected to be available in about a minute. He's usually pretty much on time for these. But overall, based on a press release that they have been sending out, um, we are ex expecting to hear that overall people do support an increase in the, BF uh, the BSA funding. That was one of the issues. And they also, 57% uh, said that changes and reforms to the education system are the most important factors um, in uh, improving education outcome compared to 33% who said that increasing education funding is the most important factor for improving education outcomes. So again, we're getting ready to hear from uh, Governor Mike Dunleavy. We've got a lot going on this afternoon across the state, but we will bring it all to you here from our digital desk. We're just waiting for the governor to appear as he talks about a public opinion poll, which f he says finds overwhelming support for education reform in Alaska. We'll hear what he has to say here in just a few minutes. I am Tracy Sinclair with Alaska's News Source. We are waiting for Governor Mike Dunleavy to begin this press availability down in Juneau. Again, speaking about a public opinion poll. Uh, this was a poll that was conducted at the end of March, March 20th through the 24th of this year. And it overall, it says 75% support an open enrollment system. They support, 73% um, support public charter schools using excess capacity of other public schools. That has also been a question arisen, at least particularly here in the Anchorage area. We have seen that come up. And that 71% support a bonus incentive program to recruit and retain teachers. That's one of the items that Governor Dunleavy has put on as a, we'll call it a must do in his list. Again, just waiting for Governor Dunleavy and it looks like he is arriving right now. Sorry, we're having problems with the audio. I will get this figured out very quickly. A uh, fishbowl. A lot of us talk to each other all the time. Uh, most of the people of Alaska are not in Juneau. Most of the people in Alaska have never been to Juneau. They can't get to Juneau. Um, and so we want to reach out to them to see what they're really thinking about education. Um, as many of you know, uh, my background is education. When I was on the school board in Matsu, we tried to um, put in as many programs as possible that would capture as many kids, meaning alternative schools, middle college concepts, enhanced homeschool, et cetera. Um, that seemed to work well for the Matsu. A lot of kids, when I first went to uh, the Matsu, we had a couple thousand, maybe 3,000 kids 
within the borough of Matsu's borders that were not attending our schools. We want to know why. So we began a process to try to figure out why our kids weren't attending, and then we started to modify our approaches with charter schools, uh, with uh, uh, middle college concepts, as I mentioned, enhancing the home schools, et cetera. And we got more of our kids within our borders to go to our schools. That's really what we wanted to accomplish because we, feel that we felt that we should be uh, educating those kids within the system. The same uh, ideas I brought to the Senate and to the governorship, and that is, you know, people talk about private uh, education and private this and private that. Um, we had a conversation about that early in my Senate career on vouchers. And from my perspective, there wasn't the support for such a thing. And really our Constitution made it very difficult to, to do such a thing as vouchers. After that uh, discussion, I really took a deep dive into our public education process, and I really do believe that we can have one of the best edu uh, public educational uh, processes in the country, one of the best educational systems in the country. But in order to do that, we're going to have to make sure that statewide we have the opportunities for kids uh, to be part of different approaches to education because uh, there's different needs in different families and kids have different needs individually. So long story short, this was part of the whole charter school con uh, conversation we've been having for the last couple months. Uh, we all know we need to fund education. There's no, I don't think there's really much disagreement on that. But the question is, do we just do what we've done the past 10, 20 years, and that is fund education, and then everyone goes away, nobody talks about education again, and we still end up with performance that we know could be better? This, was, this trajectory was changed a little bit back in November when we did get some uh, information on research that our charter schools are some of the best in the nation, actually number one. Now people have questioned, obviously, the, uh, the uh, efficacy, I guess, of that research. What's interesting, in, in 2004, there was a researcher named Hoxby, H-O-X-B-Y, who also did research on charter schools nationwide and found back then that Alaska's charter schools were actually doing well then as well. So I think there's enough research out there to, to val validate that our charter schools are doing well. We wanted to expand those charter schools. We know where the situation uh, you know, was with the bill and the veto and the veto override. And um, right now there's a bill that's uh, moved into from house education into house finance. That could be a vehicle to once again put in funding, put in charter school, language, et cetera. And we'll see where that goes. But again, I wanted to really find out where the people of Alaska were. I knew where the people were in this building I knew where a lot of the lobbyists are. I knew where a lot of the um, this NEA and school boards association were. They made it clear to me where they were at, that um, they didn't want to give up local control on charter schools, which was an interesting story because you would have people talking to us about what seemed to be important to them was not giving up local control to the state, which the state oversees schools. It's kind of interesting. But people outside the building in Juneau were talking about funding. So it's kind of trying to figure out what it really is. Is it funding or is it uh, control? Probably a combination of both. Long story short, we commissioned a poll. Uh, we have the pollster here, uh, Matt Larkin with Dittman, that'll talk about the poll. Uh, we're going to go through the poll step by step. He will. You guys can ask as many questions as possible, as many detailed as questions as possible to understand the poll. We're doing this because once you do a poll to try and find out where people are at and you're using public money, the poll has to go public. It's, it's a public document. So that's what we're doing today is we're releasing that poll in its entirety for the public to take a look at. Um, so with that, uh, I think what we're going to do is have uh, uh, Mr. Larkin come up, start to go through the process. This was a large poll, uh, at least 800 people in terms of the um, sampling size. Um, and we'll uh, have an idea where I think a uh, majority of Alaskans are. And I think what we'll find is that a lot of Alaskans, or the majority of Alaskans, uh, from the perspective of this poll is they also believe in um, providing uh, different approaches to education but also funding education. So I think the people of Alaska are in somewhat of agreement with a lot of folks here in the legislature, myself and others that want to see a comprehensive package uh, if it were to occur. But with that said, as I mentioned before, there is going to be funding for education. So the school districts are going to get funding to be able to run their schools going into next year. The question is whether we're going to have a long-term agreement on what that funding looks like um, and also uh, what, uh, what we're going to do with things like uh, charter schools and uh, um, uh, 
homeschool, uh, homeschool monies, which was in the last bill. I don't think there was much argument there as well. So with that, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Larkin come up, go through the process, and I think you're going to stop every now and then and ask these folks if they have questions, okay? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Larkin with Dittman Research, and I'm pleased to go through the uh, PowerPoint today on our poll that uh, we did for the, for the governor's office. Um, I wanted to just start by saying that you've got uh, a printout of the, the PowerPoint, I think, and then you also have the top lines here. And what, you, what I wanted to point out is the top lines um, give you the order that the questions were asked. This is where the respondents were walk through. When I do the slides, I don't always show the questions in the same order in the slides. We tend to order the slides a little differently. So I wanted to point that out because I'm going to spend most of the time on the slide deck. But if you're curious about the order of the questions or how they were read or the questions wordings, you, you have that on the on this top line sheet. So uh, with that, I'll get started. Uh, as the governor mentioned, this was a, a large sample, uh, methodologically speaking, uh, 810. Uh, we also conducted oversamples in some of the smaller regions, uh, Fairbanks, uh, Southeast, and uh, Western Alaska. Um, the methodology produced a highly representative sample. I'll show you here. Um, if, you look at the, if you look at the chart there, what, what we're showing you is two things. One, the, the margin of error, the relationship of sample size on margin of error. Um, what you can see there is that margin of error actually flattens out. You, you, you have diminishing returns with sample size. And so you see there at 800, um, you're at a 3.4% 3, 3 margin of error. You do not meaningfully decrease margin of error by increasing sample size at that point. Um, what, uh, what you see on the right is a chart that shows you the representation of the sample. And so on, on the left side of that chart is the actual uh, demographics of Alaska. And on the right, you see our survey sample. And what you want to look for is symmetry across that axis to the extent um, we've achieved it and we like what we see there. Uh, as far as key findings go, uh, we, we see that Alaskans, uh, about three quarters of Alaskans rate our public school system uh, on, a, on a grading scale of C or below. And this was a question that we originally came up with in 2014 when we asked this question for the legislature. We did, did a project for the um, majority caucus there in 2014. And so we'll go through that tracking question. But that is, that is lower scores than where Alaskans scored the schools 10 years ago. So there's some movement there. Uh, as far as awareness goes, um, we, we seek to test awareness on these types of surveys, usually in the beginning of the survey. What we see is about half of Alaskans are generally aware of uh, our current test scores and rankings, our school age population um, is decreasing, and the school's operating below capacity. So you can think of about half Alaskans know that information, and the other half do not. Um, what you'll see uh, as I get into the presentation here is that Alaskans strongly support an increase in funding education. Uh, they also strongly support uh, a number of reforms to, to the education system. And so that comes through loud and clear on this poll, and uh, in, 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 uh, you'll see. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight here is, is when it comes to the question of increasing student achievement or student performance or outcomes, what is the most important factor? On, and, and by a margin of 1.7 to 1, Alaskans would say change in reforms to the systems are the most important factor uh, versus edu increasing education funding. So it's not a question of do they think funding is important. They do, and they support it. But it's a question of what is likely to raise student outcomes. And Alaskans would be, uh, by a margin of 1.7 to 1, would say change in reforms to the education system. So um, I'll walk you through some of the various proposals here that we tested. And uh, what I've got uh, up now is a chart and uh, descending order showing you support for various proposals. You see support for BSA funding, support for an open enrollment system, support for public charter schools using excess school capacity, support for a bonus incentive program for teacher um, retention. And uh, sorry, I'm squinting a little bit. Uh, support for business tax credits. Uh, support for greater allocation for homeschooling and charter schools. <coughs> um, 
support for consolidation of some school buildings where student impact is minimal. Okay, and so we're gonna go through this, but this is um, really what we see is that there is strong support for increasing funding, there's strong support for these reform proposals as well. <coughs> All right, baseline views and awareness. This first, this first slide um, is really a demographic question, but we wanted to show it first so that we could um, sort of level set on the school age population that we have. Um, 38% of the survey sample um, reported having kids at home. Um, and then you can see how they reported their current status of their schools. So 61% in public schools, um, the remainder in charter home or private. Um, and then you can see demographically out on the right how that falls out by age, uh, political party, education level, household income, and geographic location. And this, uh, what I'll do on this, this slide also is just point out um, you know, how we do our slides. So in, in s when you see the blue bars on the crosstabs, what we're signifying there is that that represents um, th the largest category of that particular line. And so when you see all of that blue, what that means is you can think of as that's majority support or you know, significant plurality of support there. Uh, or in this case, it's not necessarily support, but it's which school do you go to. But that way of reporting data is carried out throughout our slides. The other thing that we do is we highlight these, those circles are meant to draw your attention to where we have a, a finding in the crosstab that uh, deviates significantly from the baseline, uh, or at least enough to, to call attention to it. So that's what we're looking to do with those circles and those color codes there. All right, uh, assigning a letter grade to Alaska's public schools, A, B, C, D, E, or, F, or not E, or F. Uh, what we see here is 73% of Alaskans would rate our schools a C, D, or F. Um, and then you can see in the charts below and on the side how that ranking or rating is applied across different uh, subgroups and demographics with the, the dotted line in the middle being the, the average. Okay, and then we, as I mentioned, this was actually a tracking question from a legislative survey, also an 800 sample survey that we did in 2014. And what I would just point out is that, uh, you know, the opinions moving down the, the grade scale in the last 10 years. All right, awareness, it's a little bit more detailed breakout on awareness of local education issues. So this is awareness of our test scores, our population trends, and capacity of the school buildings. And as I mentioned, it's, you can think of it as roughly half of Alaskans are aware of those things. All right, um, best approach to improving education outcomes. So what we asked is what in, in uh, Alaskans' opinions, the most important factor in improving education outcomes. Is it changes in reforms or is it increasing funding? And by a margin of 57 to 33, Alaskans said changes in reforms are the most important factor to improve outcomes. And you can see the um, crosstab information there on the side and then I've got a more detailed crosstab slide next on this question. This question came at the end of the survey, so when you look at the top lines, you'll see that it came at the end as after we'd gotten into it, what a number of these changes and reforms actually are. So. Okay. And this is some more detailed breakout of responses to this question. Um, but what you actually see with this is this question isn't, lar isn't largely partisan. Uh, there's not a big partisan divide on it. <coughs> You look through the age demos, uh, income demos, um, and political ideology, um, you see amongst Republicans, Democrats, moderates, um, you do definitely see more support on the conservative side of the spectrum than you do on the liberal side, but by and large, um, this, is, this issue is not viewed politically. All right, use of the PFD to funding an increase in education outcomes. Um, so this was a step down question from the previous one. And so uh, the group that, the third that said that 
uh, ed education funding is the most important factor. They received a, a second question asking if it were necessary to reduce PFDs to supply this funding to, um, and what we see is that um, most of those in that group of that 33 would be willing to do that um, and that is re represents about 23 percent of Alaskans overall so we're showing it overall there but it's it's a, it's a majority of the 33. All right, I'm going to get into some various proposals. Consolidating under capacity school buildings, um, 56 to 32. Um, we really see this across the state with the exception of rural Alaska, and, and that makes sense to us as we know the importance of school buildings in rural communities and sort of the center of town and a lot of places. And so that, that finding made sense to us there. But in other regions of the state, Alaskans um, report that this sounds like something makes sense to them. Uh, we don't see large variances on political party differences here, uh, ideology. Um, you see all that, all that blue there means that there's agreement there on that. <coughs> and then if uh, similar to the previous question, at a PFD follow-up for those that wanted to, f to fund to keep all the schools open. And what we see here is a less support than the previous question for using the PFD to, to keep schools open. Um, roughly half of those that, that said that we should do that um, don't think we should use the PFD for that. Charter school use of excess capacity, 73% um, um, support, 13% oppose, um, significant support across all demographic subgroups. Open enrollment program, 75% support across all demographic subgroups as well. Greater funding for charter schools, significant support, 64% to 29. Support among Democrats, Republicans, um, Nonpartisans are, are split more evenly on this. Um, support in all the regions. Greater funding for homeschool, also significant support, less so than for charter schools, but 58 to 36. You do see in the crosstab some differences in the opposition on this. You see more pink there that's showing you pink versus blue, showing you the the difference on this. Strong support in South Central. See a divide here among union households and public employee unions and teachers unions, but other union households are supportive. <coughs> okay. I know this is a lot of data to throw at you here, so I know I'm moving pretty fast, but looking forward to questions. So, um, and finally, the last slide I have here, uh, we had an agree-disagree battery on um, education proposals. Um, and so this is sorted into sending order on agreement. Uh, increase base education funding to maintain school operations. It's sort of our BSA equivalent question there, 77. Uh, offering a bonus incentive program to help recruit and retain teachers, 71% support. Providing a corporate and business tax credit for donations made to public schools, 69% support. These are, these are all things that when you, when you get polling that numbers are <coughs> this high in agreement, th these things tend to be uh, viewed really just as common sense ideas among the public. Uh, providing resources to transport students to school of their choice, more mixed on that, but 54% uh, would say they agree. Um, so with that, I'm um, happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, I can jump back around the slides. I can turn the mic back over to the governor. So um, thank you for the opportunity to present to you. Yeah, so we'll start with questions here in the room with Sean McGuire with the Anchorage Daily News. Um, Sean McGuire, Anchorage Daily News. Could I, can I just quickly ask how much this poll cost? I, I think 37,500, I believe. 37,500? Yes. Okay. I also just had a question on page uh, the best approach to improving education outcomes. Mm -hmm. 
The question's phrased, Alaska is among the top five states in the nation when it comes to education spending on a per student basis. However, student graduation rates and test scores in Alaska's public schools consistently rank among the lowest in the nation. The debate around improving education outcomes generally, generally comes down to two approaches. I'm just wondering, as a professional surveyor, doesn't that come across potentially as a loaded question, trying to get a specific result? No. No? no. Could you explain why? Yes. Um, when you're doing public policy polling on detailed um, matters, it is entirely appropriate to provide relevant context to the respondent. And um, that is how you actually get meaningful findings out of a poll, as opposed to asking um, general questions to an uninformed audience. And so what we have always sought to do with our state polling, and if you go look at our surveys that we've done for the legislature, you'll see these types of questions all throughout, including a question just like this, um, where we provide the relevant context. Now, I think um, when it comes to polling, you know, I, you know, I've been doing this for 14 years, we understand that, that polling, this is a charged debate. We understand that there's people on both sides, and we also understand that when um, it comes to parsing through polling data, you'll have different opinions on question wording. But I think the question should be, is the context accurate, and is it directly relevant to that question and that respondent? And I'd also point out that we know that 50% of our respondents didn't know our test scores, okay? Doesn't know our funding levels. So we can see that in the survey itself, and so that's why we seek to inform. But, um, you know, and, and if you look at the cross tabs on that question, you can see that it's, it's um, fairly uniform across the various subgroups in that belief. I'd also say that it's important to focus on what the specific question being asked is in that question which is what is the most important factor? That's the question that's being asked. So it's not a funding question. It's a question on what's the most important factor. All right, next we'll go to Mark Sabatini with the Juno Empire. Thanks. Actually, I had very much a similar question as uh, Sean because I'm looking at a number of questions. Uh, and to put bluntly, this looks very much like a push-pull design to get uh, intended responses to a thing. So it goes from uh, uh, um, facilities that uh, are operating as low as one half capacity. No idea how many of those facilities are at one half capacity or why they're operating at that. The uh, reference to our charter schools, which as the governor has noted, some folks have raised questions about. Um, there's no context. When you say best in the nation, it refers to 35 states and there are, again, qualifiers in the study. Um, Demand for homeschooling is increasing in Alaska. Doesn't uh, really get into that. And then, of course, with the question he mentions, um, top five in the nation on per student basis. Yeah, but why? Alaska is more expensive than many things. You say that uh, this all provides proper context, but on what basis are you making that judgment? Um, who is determining this is proper context for all of these things? Ultimately, it's us. It's our firm. I mean, but I'll tell you that <coughs> pollsters and our firm in particular, is not interested in doing any type of push-pull. We don't do those kind of polls. We, we refuse to do them. So I understand what you just said, but we just disagree with your, your interpretation of the work that we've done. Well, yeah. This was a study commissioned by the governor's office. Um, how much input did they have in shaping these questions and how they were presented? As every project we do, our clients have significant roles in shaping what we're testing. We're asking them what do they want to know, what aspects of the policy are they really seeking to verify. So they have significant roles, as do all of our clients and all of our projects. All right, next we'll go to Steve Kirk with KTUU. Yeah, so I'm looking at the poll and you know, it was 810 people. So my first question is, is like, do you think 810 is a high enough number to get an accurate poll? And my second question is, how many of these say were unique? I mean, how many came from different, like how many households? Did some of these responses come from, this, come from the same household? How many were different households and stuff like that? Yeah, not from the same household. I mean, it's, it's technically possible because we're calling cell phones and we're, we're texting cell phones. It's technically possible, but it's, it's very unlikely. Um, and as far as the 800 sample, I'd come back to the methodology here, and it's a, it's a random sample of 810, and you, 
produces the margin of error result that you can see. So we're confident based on our understanding of how that works. All right, next we have Jordan Lewis with KINY. Uh, hi, Jordan Lewis with KINY. So my question is obviously you note here that you have made sure that it was highly representative for locations, terms, age, gender, politi gender political affiliation, and that. How did you make sure that those smaller communities, I know you said you oversampled them, mm -hmm. maybe give me more Give me more to explain how you made sure that those communities were also more representative within this sample in this this uh, poll versus just Anchorage, which obviously was going to end up being the bulk of the responses, by and large, just the nature of that's the largest population center of the right. state. That's right. Yeah, I usually have a map in some of these presentations, and I realize we didn't put the slide with a map in here. So, um, But that's a great question. I'll speak to that. Um, the law of large numbers and random sampling, okay, will produce a geographically representative sample just by random sampling the, the numbers that we call. And so that's how we ensure that there's a correct number of people in the various regions. I mean, it's essentially the law of large numbers and random sampling. It's if you took a big jar of M&Ms and you started pulling out, once you randomly sampled 400, you'd have a random sample that would be highly representative of the number of colors in, those, in that jar. And it really works the same with opinions and people. So uh, we're randomly sampling the entire state, and the geographic distributions fall out representatively that way. And they do that for all the other demographics as well, age, gender, income. So it's pretty cool how that works. To your question on the oversamples, the reason we do that is that helps us w isolate those smaller regions and look at them on their own. Because what happens in a state like ours where we have the population distribution as you described, most of it in urban areas in South Central, uh, that sample, if you did a, an 800 sample and our population being what it is, you, would, you wouldn't really have necessarily a large enough sample to examine the rural Alaska completely on their own. You'd have a higher margin of error there. So what we do with the oversamples is to reduce margin of error in the regions. And so the oversamples in this case um, give us a margin of error in rural Alaska of 11, in Anchorage of 6, South Central of 7, Okay, and southeast of, I think, seven as well. And then the overall total sample is 3.4. 3 Our next bit of Jeff Landfield with the Alaska Landmine. Um, I just want to say, uh, you're probably not very good at promoting yourself, but Matt's one of the leading pollsters in the state. He's been continu constantly recognized by national polling firms as like the best poller in the state. So um, I have no issue with your poll. I mean, Matt, Matt's a really good pollster. So, but I have a question for the governor, actually. Um, the first question says are we on the right track or wrong track and 65% say the wrong track and I'm not targeting you I've asked Senator Mikowski this question the House and the Senate um, you know people are leaving the state the education obviously people think it's bad we can't build anything the roads are road plowing is an issue this out migration it's been going on for a decade since the price of oil dropped in 2015 why how can we fix that? I mean, it's really, there's like a malaise in the state that we can, we can all feel. Well, uh, that's a great question, Jeff. That's the question we've been operating off of and working on for some time. So, as I mentioned, we have uh, a number of energy bills that I think are gonna transform Alaska over time, if I refrain right now. Education, I, I think we can sell, um, for example, our charter school system to the country, to be honest with you. I don't think the country realizes that our charter school systems are performing well. Now, there are people that would like to not have that narrative happen. I don't know why. I, I, I don't understand that. Um, we actually are, are creating more jobs in the state of Alaska with work on the slope with Willow and other projects that are happening. And I think you're going to see that uh, increase even more over the next couple of years, not just saying that, not for re-election. Um, but there's no doubt that um, taking a beating from the federal government the last couple of years doesn't help. Having a number of projects shut down, ANWR, uh, offshore oil leases, et cetera. We are a resource producing state. <coughs> there was a time in the heyday of oil and oil exploration. I came to the state in the 1980s. I think we we're at 400,000. We almost doubled that since then. But you're right. Uh, we're, we're stuck at a uh, we're stuck at a, a, a population that doesn't seem to be growing, and some people are leaving. We are getting immigrants here as well. But nonetheless, um, I think there's a number of factors at play. We're trying to work on those. Um, energy is one. The ability to develop our resources, a lot of that is out of our hands if it's on federal government lands. I spoke to this in the state of the state that we got to be able to say yes to as many things as possible and not no to as many things as possible. 
So we're just we're continuing to work the issue. But again, I I'm not going to belabor the charter school issue. I just as an educator, I'm thrilled to death that we had outside researchers, not just in last fall, but in 2004, with Hoxby again, that research charter schools that our charter schools are doing well, and we'd like to be able to replicate that on a larger scale. We'd be able we'd like to be able to do more in our public schools, and so I think it's a combination of things. Um, but I, I certainly believe that um, we should be legislating and governing for the people of Alaska and not the special interests of Alaska. You're down here, Jeff, you're reporting. Uh, you're intermingling with a whole host of folks that are government affairs people, lobbyists, uh, groups that also uh, uh, represent special interests. I have to make sure that we govern and we legislate for the people of Alaska. It's too easy to govern and legislate for the special interest. And I think that's what's happened to Alaska over the past 10 years, to be honest with you. There are th those that want to get rid of the PFD. Those, there are those that want to pretend that the charter schools really aren't doing that well because that m makes it seem like the neighborhood schools aren't doing well. There are those that uh, don't want to use new technology and energy like wind and solar. Those are those that want to get rid of uh, uh, fossil fuel-based fuels. Alaska really has got to be an all-in state for everything. Good neighborhood schools, good charter schools, good home schools. Renewables, wind and solar, fossil fuels. Um, we don't have the luxury to say no because of the tenuous economic situation that we have here. But I think things are stabilizing. I think things will get better. And our energy and resource opportunities are second to none. And so if we could just put that into play with good policies, I think you're going to see better outcomes. All right, next we'll Claire Strimple with <coughs> Alaska Beacon. Thanks, Claire Strimple with Alaska Beacon. This is actually a question for Mr. Larkin. Um, I'm curious about, it looks like 57% of Alaskans polled support reforms and changes and about 80%, 77% uh, support permanent funding increase, yet more people thought reforms and changes were the most important thing and fewer thought that funding was. How do you interpret those results? And if, if you could ask another question next to tease that out, what would it be? So that, that, the w that question is specifically asking the most important factor to increase student outcomes. So it's, it's not asking them, are they for increased funding? Are they for reforms? In fact, you would have the majority of Alaskans saying they're for both of those things. So it's simply asking of those two things that there is majority support for, which one of them is the most important factor to improving education outcomes? And so that was really you know, what we see a lot of this debate about. And so that was a question that we sought to encapsulate fairly both sides of the debate and, and then ask what do they think is the most important factor. And it was a question that the governor's office really wants to know how Alaskans view those things. Um, so that's, that's how to look at that question. Is it's, it's not a funding question. It's, it's a question on most important factor to increase student outcomes. What's the student outcome? All right, now we're going to go to the phone lines with a Carter DeJong with the Fairbanks Daily News Miner. Hi there, Carter DeJong with the Fairbanks Daily News Miner. And my question is actually for the, for the governor. Um, you know, I guess the number that stuck out most to me was that 77% of Alaskans say they support increasing the BSA. Um, you know, if, if that is so important to Alaskans, you know, why, why do you so SB 140? Like, couldn't, couldn't you just sign the bill? and then continue to advocate for charter schools and teacher bonuses. I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, how, how would you defend a veto in light of that 77% number? Um, once we put a permanent increase in for the BSA, the chances of reform are very slim. Historically speaking, that's been the case. That's been my case in the state since the early 1980s. It's been my case when I was a, a school board member. That's been my ca the case when I was a senator. It's the case I see now. A lot of volume around increases in money, and then once the money is secured, crickets. Crickets on outcomes, crickets on reform, crickets. So I don't, I don't understand why there can't be two sides of the coin. I don't understand why it has to be one side, money, that's it. That, that's all we got is money. Jeff just alluded to, uh, you know, folks believe that our educational system is not doing well, generally speaking. The polls seem to reflect that. Why would we want to... There, there, there's a, there's an, to me, it's, a, it's mystifying to some degree why the focus is simply on money and not enhancing our outcomes, especially when 
our charter schools appear to be doing well, and more and more people are going to home schools. Why is it just about the systems and the things and not about the individual people? And so um, I was elected twice to the chagrin of a minority, but twice. And part of my election was predicated upon doing things for individuals that can't lobby in Juno, that don't have special interest groups in Juno. And so what the people are telling me is, yes, we want our schools funded. Everybody has said that. But what you're not hearing down here is we want educational reform as well. We want to grow our home schools, grow our charter schools, make our uh, neighborhood schools better. You don't hear that. But the people of Alaska want that to happen. So I'm going to govern for the people of Alaska, not the special interests. All right, next we'll go to Ira Samuels with the ADN. Hi, this is Ira Samuels with the Anchorage Daily News. I have a couple questions for Mr. Larkin. Um, the first is about um, the sample that was used. It looks like um, the parents of students in charter schools are highly overrepresented. Um, it looks like of, the, of those questioned who have kids in school, 19% their kid was in a charter school, which is far more than their portion in Alaska schools. So I'm curious why that overrepresentation. And then my other question is about the proposal to empower the State Board of Education to um, allow new charter schools to form. Um, that is one of the major debates this year in terms of um, reform, so I'm curious why there isn't a question about that in the survey. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first question um, first. Um, the act, yes, yeah, so, so we have, the question is the breakout of the 38% of the families that have students in the house the breakout among public, charter, homeschooled, and private schools. Um, when we looked at what that actually is, um, we think we are a little high in that category of non-public school, um, the way we have it on the chart. We're at 61%. We think that number is closer to 70, 69, somewhere in there. And the other schools, um, charter, home, and private, um, would comprise about 25 percent okay we see that there's confusion among exactly what a charter school is with some people we see that there's some confusion among home school and being a home charter school and we actually think that the category is a little low here on home school we think that number is supposed to be a little higher among this this mix and so the way we look at it is we put them together we grouped them together in our th in our thought process and said um, we overshot a little bit, but we're pretty close. And then I'd also point out that we're talking about a 38% of, of the sample, okay? So we're not talking about a significant um, overrepresentation of that cohort uh, in terms of totality in the sample. It ends up being about 3% of the total sample when you look at that difference. So it is something we noticed. Um, it happens sometimes in survey research. I mean, we, we're you know sampling um, far and wide, but response rates, you know, coming in where they are, um, you know, uh, but it's not the type of variance that would cause us to, to cons have any concern that the findings of the poll are, are uh, effective. Okay, and so the second question was, why didn't we include a question on um, what again? Charter schools, char uh, charter, um, charter schools. Yes, Iris, again, with the, with the English Daily News, it's, uh, why wasn't there a question about the proposal to allow the State Board of Education to um, to um, approve new charter schools? Well, I can only say that it just, that, that actually never came up in our, our conversations uh, with, with the, the governor's office and, and working on this questionnaire. It just wasn't something that was a, a focus. It wasn't mentioned. So it wasn't excluded on intentionally, I can tell you that. <coughs> All right, well, next. So maybe the question is better, better directed at the governor. Why wasn't that, why wasn't that part of the request to ask about this proposal that's been so important to the governor this year? Uh, it, it, it just didn't come up. Um, there's, um, there's only so many questions one can ask. There's, there's always going to be uh, the ability, to be honest with you, Iris, to uh, second guess the questions in the poll. But it just simply didn't come up. It wasn't, uh, 
explicitly left out. It just was not something that came up. I mean, when I look at the poll, when I look at the questions in the poll, I'm, I'm sure there's other questions I could have uh, asked to, to have on the poll, but it just didn't come up. All right, next we'll go to Tim Rocky with Alaska Public Media. My question is for the governor. Um, I was hoping to ask, uh, what correlation do you see between the results of this polling and the provisions that you signaled your support for throughout the session? Those would be changes to the charter school approval process and then increased funding for correspondence programs uh, that would impact a relatively small percentage of Alaska public school students. What, what do you think this research says for those, those groups of students? I hope I understand the question. Um, I think what it shows is that the people of Alaska, people of Alaska, myself, and a number of legislators are in alignment on um, uh, the, the, uh, the view of public education in the state of Alaska. Um, very few people have I heard that says that uh, there should be no, uh, mo no money in education or cut, cut funding. Very few. Uh, I don't agree with the idea of cutting funding in education. I know people when they look at the veto last year, it was an increase, it's just we didn't increase it as much as some wanted. But nonetheless, we want to have long-term stability, not just in funding, but in the ability for more uh, alternative and different approaches to public education to take place in Alaska. So right now, what the people of Alaska need to understand is there are special interest groups standing in the way of some of these reforms we're talking about. I mean, if there wasn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation. If we want this conversation to go away, we can do that easily. Just give the teachers associations and the school board associations what they want. And then this conversation will end. And everyone uh, will be happy. Except the fact that, as Jeff pointed out, the poll seemed to point out, and the test scores seemed to poll, uh, point out, we're not doing as well as we once did, and there's ways to do better. So we have to ask, ask ourselves the question, do we want to do better in education? I think most people, including the people in Alaska, say yes. And do they want to have uh, more funding for, uh, uh, stable funding for education? Yes. But what I gather from the poll is they don't want those things being separate. They want it all to go over the finish line at once. And so um, I think we have another opportunity with the bill that's in the House right now. If that doesn't work out, then there'll be funding for education this year. But then we work on a, another bill next year that includes a lot of the things we're talking about again, and we'll see what the legislature looks like next year and what they want to do. Turn back to you. Oh, okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, again, this poll was done right around the veto and the veto override. So just when people were reading newspapers and reading blogs and the stories were about cutting funding and uh, harming education, this poll was done. It was commissioned by my office because I wanted to know what the people of Alaska think. I really did. I had no idea what the outcomes would be. I thought they would be similar to this. I was hoping they'd be similar to this because of the conversations I have with people. And um, contrary to some belief, I, I do get out and talk to people that what they're telling me is we want our schools to be the best they can be. My kid goes to a charter school. My kid goes to a home school. My kid goes to a neighborhood school. My kids graduate from Wasilla High. Then go to a private school. Went to a public school, a neighborhood school. So the people of Alaska want our educational system to be the best it can be. Why does it end at funding every year? Why is that the only conversation we have? And so I'm going to do my best to govern on behalf of the people that elected me. Trust me, the school board's association and the teacher's association did not campaign for me and did not elect me. Individual Alaskans did, and that's who I care about. You'll hear me say time after time, it's the single mom with two or three kids that we need to set up a system for in the state of Alaska, whether it's good roads, good schools. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, I've been told many times I'm a stickler on the PFD. You name it but I'm gonna do everything I can to help individual Alaskans. Less interested in helping special interest groups. And so the battle you're seeing play out right now is a battle between just funding or funding and educational reform. The just funders don't want educational reform. If they did, 
we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. So a lot of the loud voices that want just funding, they do not want educational reform. They don't want it. And I would challenge you guys to ask them the question, why? Why aren't you supporting an expansion of the charter schools? Why are you having a hard time with some of these approaches that we're talking about? Ask them the questions. John, is that a follow-up after the closing? Go ahead. Uh, it seems that the biggest impediment is having the State Board of Education, that your point, being able to uh, authorize a new charter. The guy that was elected by the people of Alaska, the board that I put in, that is per constitution, I do that, and then the legislature confirms those people. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, there are <coughs> other options to have as a second charter school authorized, but you're choosing. Oh, I think there's, I think there's, I, I think there's all kinds of opportunities to have uh, uh, other types of authorizers. Yes. I mean, you talk about ed education mm -hmm. reform, but the big reform we're talking about is have this one board authorize new charter schools. I'm just, I'm still confused after all of this to understand why specifically that board. So unfortunately, we are going to have to break away here from this press conference. If you would like to continue to watch the remainder, you can go to alaskasnewsource.com, click on the live tab in the banner, and choose live events. We will continue to feed that through that method. And we are getting ready for another press conference. We'll be coming back here in just a few moments with Mayor Bronson talking about changes in leadership at the Anchorage Police Department. different approaches to education. That's a fact. I was also a superintendent and a board member when I would go to some of these meetings in some of these associations, and they were focused on stopping the growth of homeschools, charter schools, and other alternative schools. 